Are we calling the meeting to order then? Mr. Plato, can you call the roll, please? Jennifer Harden. Here. Jack Miley. Here. Belinda Grassi. Here. Tom Hack. Here. Stephen Jeffries. Here. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. On behalf of the board, I would like to welcome all students, staff, parents, and interested community members to tonight's Board of Education meeting. I would like to remind everyone that this is a meeting of the Board of Education held in public for the purpose of conducting the school district's business and is not considered a public community meeting. There is time for public comment during the meeting in the public participation section on the agenda. I have a motion to approve the minutes from the October 25th, 2016 board meeting. Can I have a second, please? I'll second. Is there any discussion? Call the roll, please. Jack Miley? Aye. Belinda Grassi? Aye. Tom Hack? Aye. Stephen Jeffries? Aye. Jennifer Harden? Aye. Motion carried. All right, special reports. Do we have anything other than? Uh, we don't, but I, I figured we could talk about it at the end about expression of uh, just the fact that uh, we're very happy and thankful that the community passed our uh, bond levy. Uh, a couple of weeks ago. It gives us the opportunity to build two larger elementary schools yes. uh, with better uh, instructional space and uh, able to take uh, decommission for other buildings that sap a lot of money out of our uh, PI levy. And uh, it's a great time for the district. We have a lot of work ahead of us, but we just want to express our gratitude towards the community for having the trust and faith and confidence that we're going to improve um, the facilities for our kids. And I'd also like to add, too, that they're not here, but to thank Lori Kaminsky and Rhonda Sopit for taking all the time that they took to run this levy campaign, and they did a really amazing job, and you know how many hours it took them away from their own families, and how much as a district we appreciate their help. Absolutely. No, I mean, what, a, what a tremendous a, a community achievement it is. Absolutely. So, yeah. Okay. Then we'll move on to old business. Do we have any? No? New business? I'm going to boogie right along. All right, Board of Education Committee and Liaison Reports. First up is me, Superintendent's Business Advisory Liaison. We had a meeting last week, which was nice. We had a whole new group of people that had come in from um, anything from our some um, township trustees to large companies and small ones. And so it was, it was really nice. It was good to have a good group together. That, um, yeah, we're meeting again in, I think, what, March? That's what Kate said. All right, Mr. Miley, curriculum and programming boosters. Okay, um, curriculum and programming, um, that committee meeting was canceled, uh, rescheduled for December, and the boosters club was canceled, and <laughs> that's rescheduled, I believe, in January. January yep. <laughs> Mr. Miley, you don't happen to know the date of the curriculum meeting, would you? Uh, I think it was supposed to be right before the board meeting. December 6th. Is our next board meeting? Oh, no. 7 o'clock, I believe. That day. 6. A.M. In the morning, yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So just to, sorry to delay things. Um, so the curriculum meeting is December 6 at 7 a.m. Uh -huh. Thank you. Okay. Mrs. Grassi, finance and audit. Let's we have see. not had a finance and audit committee meeting since our last board meeting, but I would anticipate we'll probably have one maybe sometime in December as we ramp up things with the bond issue. Um, and legislative, I have nothing to report at this time. Okay. Mr. Hack, Buildings and Grounds. So we just had a, a Buildings and Grounds meeting before our board meeting, and um, we had a chance to talk with some, some folks from uh, Norfolk and Southern. Mm -hmm. um, and just to expand a little bit, they are looking to basically buy a 15-foot stretch of our property for about 1,100 feet, and they, they're going to replace, bypass the existing trestle and build a new one. So that was on the agenda and, and more to come there. Can uh, I ask a question? You may. How is that going to affect traffic? Putting so, a new there. So that was a that, that came up <laughs> during the, the meeting. And um, the, the gentlemen who are here were both more real estate oriented and not engineer oriented. Okay. So at, at our next meeting we're gonna try to get them uh, the engineers here to better have them un better understand our circumstances because you know, it's obviously very complex from a from a transportation perspective right. here at the school. So I can't imagine we could do a, a one-lane closure type of thing. Right. So we want to investigate that further, and so they have more information, and, and we can 
plan accordingly. We, we basically told them that it would be so much better that if they're going to close the roads that they do it in the summer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, more to come there, but hopefully on December 6th we will have an engineer there and uh, he'll be able to describe more. And we, then we talked about some more long-term planning and different things that, from a maintenance perspective and making sure that we stay on top of things. And, um, and, uh, and that was what we discussed. And from a strategic planning perspective, um, I have nothing to report either. Can I ask one more question? You may. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. With buildings and grounds now, with the passage of the levy, how are we changing the way that we're looking at spending the PI funds now? Because certainly it's going to be kind of, I imagine, what a band-aiding process at this point of our existing elementary buildings. It's going to be based on, on safety, basically yeah. what it is. Nothing, there's not going to be anything extra. We're not going to waste uh, money uh, for right. any of those extras uh, that we sometimes buy. Um, with the idea that in two years we're going to have new building time. Right. Okay. And one of the other things that I think is important in, in that overall conversation is as, as we bring those new buildings online, which, which you know, it's, it's a phased process. It's not going to be happening tomorrow. But yeah. as, as we bring those other buildings online, equipment and other things that we can use in the decommissioned buildings, we will try to retrofit and utilize in, in our other buildings that are uh, Still. will continue. And that way we will hopefully improve the the uh, you know the uh, student environment at those uh, schools that will be enduring. So okay. we want to make sure that we take advantage of all those assets as best we can. Cool. I piggybacks off the conversation we had a few years ago when we were deciding to get new controls for our buildings, mm -hmm. and we had the opportunity to talk to Brian Wagner from CCG uh, when we were down at the OSBA conference, and he said it is poss a possibility. I'm not sure what the timing is when you're occupying one building and and you're building another building. But I think he's been through that process before, so it's something we have to address with uh, the architects and the engineers to see how that's going to work. Okay. Right. But that, I mean, the key, the key concept to take away is, is, to answer your question, is it's safety uh, right. from a maintenance perspective, and, and, uh, and then we'll take it from there. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Mr. Jeffries, personnel? Okay, personnel. There was an alumni meeting on the 14th of November. I was not able to attend that meeting, so I don't have anything to report on that. And personnel, there's nothing to report as well. Okay. That'll be it. All right. <coughs> Mr. Kayla, superintendent's report. All right. I'm going to need someone to, unless we have the remote. Steve, Steve Jeffries, did we, did we reschedule the personnel meeting? Um, I, I spoke with Chuck Houston. Okay. We were going to get together uh, and set something up, but we were waiting to talk, talk to you. You were, okay. I believe, working. Yeah, darn. <laughs> <laughs> For a paying job. It's paying job. Yeah. Yeah. Volunteer time. Yeah. I took the liberty of breaking down the pacings from our bond, which I typically do afterwards. Uh, these are still the unofficial results. <laughs> we still have the official results up as of uh, today, I looked. But uh, the unofficial results, so just a couple of things I wanted to point out here is uh, actually the highest passage rate overall in any of our precincts with any large amount of voters. So if you look at Kingsville City 3C, you're going to have three people voted yes, zero people voted no for 100%. But I, I didn't count that. Um, but if you look at Kingsville City 4A, Precinct 4A, we had a 75% passage rate. Uh, for that precinct. That's that was the highest wow. passage rate overall. Where is that? I have it on the map in there. It's a, it should be the last sheet of paper. Thank you. Last question. Also looked at the Concord precincts. In, um, in Concord, we only failed in uh, two precincts, Precinct B and um, Precinct I. We've always had trouble with Precinct I, but Precinct I was pretty close at 49% to 51%. So that was close. Um, the highest passage rate in Concord uh, was Precinct G. Yeah, it's, it's very close to being the highest amongst all the others, the Concord, Painesville Township, Leroy and Grand River, and even Chardon. Um, but there's one precinct in Painesville Township. Painesville Township Precinct I had 62% of the vote, and that is the highest passage rate other than the one that is uh, in Painesville 4A. 62%. Um, the lowest rate of passage was in Grand River. And again, traditionally speaking, we do have a hard time uh, getting people to vote for levies out in Grand River. 
55% uh, uh, voted uh, against the levy. And uh, the o lowest overall happened to be Chardon Township A. We do have, I believe, around 99 parcels uh, in uh, Geauga County and Chardon, and 61% uh, uh, voted against the levy. It was only 34 voted yes and 53 voted uh, no. Um, and I'm wondering how much of this ha was um, uh, the result of not getting the word out there as, as we send a lot of our material out. I'm not sure if we even reach out to those uh, parcels. I know we do in terms of the pipeline, don't we? But yeah. some of the other material, I'm not sure how much gets out history. there. So um, part of that could be uh, on our end as well. Um, Leroy, which has traditionally not supported uh, levies, um, they both failed, but they were really close. We had 49% uh, in each precinct voting yes and 51% uh, voting no. So it was very close. It's a lot better than what it has been in the past. But overall, it was 54% voted for our levy and 46% voted against. I uh, took the liberty of also breaking down the uh, precincts in some uh, somewhat crude maps. But just to give you an idea of the pockets of uh, support uh, in our district are illustrated on those maps. If anything changes in terms of the official results, as in terms of the uh, compared to the unofficial results, I, I can make some changes, and should be a problem. Is the now, these are just the maps. All right. Uh, the next few slides deal with the prospect of of, of a relationship we can have with Lake Health, and I did mention to the board in the past uh, about the possibility of of being able to get a synthetic turf for our field that will not, and I want to make it quite clear, this has nothing to do with our bond, okay? I want people to think that because we passed a bond, we're going to use that money for this. This is totally separate. But this is what the field looks like. You can't really see very well, uh, but it's very muddy. This is after the 10th, uh, see, 10th uh, week of football. Not only football uses, but also soccer. And uh, the, 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 the field gets very difficult to maintain, and it becomes sometimes unsafe when it's that slippery. So what I did is I took the liberty of exploring what it would take to get turf uh, on the field. Now, this is something we've worked on for the last two to three years, trying to find sponsors, because it's very expensive to buy turf, and we're not in a position to do that without some type of help or sponsorship. So. The estimated cost for synthetic turf and track restoration is <coughs> approximately about $760,000. You have to understand these numbers are very soft numbers. We've talked to a, a, a series of companies that uh, put in turf and, and build uh, tracks, um, and there's one uh, we're working with more closely than the others, and he's going to send us a, a proposal, um, a more solid proposal uh, this week. But remember, the soft numbers. December 6th, I'll have more concrete numbers, but around $760,000 for turf. All right. Lake Health is willing to do a sponsorship with us. In fact, uh, they are cutting the check for us sometime this week, they told, told me. I was able to run into Rick Cicero at our superintendent's meeting that was held over at Lake Health. The health sponsorship, and you've seen this slide before, but I wanted to reiterate the fact that they will give us $230,000 if we put turf in, which will pay for just slightly under a third of the cost. If we put a logo on the football field, a banner in the field house, a banner on the outfield fence on the varsity softball and baseball fields, and these banners are paid by Lake Health. And Lake Health shall design, uh, the Riverside Local School shall have a use a backdrop when we do our signings for our kids. And Lake Health will provide training services for 10 years for student athletes. Now, we're not going to save any on this. We, we do spend between five and $10,000 right now on tra uh, training services, not this year, but the previous years. That cost was always um, shifted over to the pay to participate. So although the district isn't going to save any money, uh, the kids will see at least a little bit of a drop in pay to participate because now for 10 years, they're going to provide training services at no cost for us. So that's another advantage. And then the big one is $230,000 for 10 year period to use uh, to upgrade our athletic facilities. So what does that mean? Well, if it's $760,000 and Lake Health is going to contribute $230,000, that leaves a balance of about $530,000.
that we have to find in order to uh, make this happen. But, as you also know, we've been working with a company that puts up cell towers. And we are going to put one up uh, sometime soon, back by the, the um, county home property. And it's on the board agenda tonight. We've been working on this since the spring. But that will generate $19,800 a year for the first five years. And then every subsequent five-year deal, it'll increase by 15%. So if you do the math, the cell tower proceeds will generate $167,310 uh, over an eight-year period, which will bring down the balance to $362,690. We also have a maintenance cost to a natural turf field, and uh, that maintenance savings will be approximately about $10,000 per year, bringing the balance down to $352,690. Now this is, the, this is a very soft number, too. I'm going to show you a chart. And it's, and it's, it'll show you what the man hours we put into the fields, the material we put into the fields. We're not going to save so much on the, the manpower. It's not, they're not going to spend, be spending time on the field. They'll be spending time on other things. It's not like we're getting rid of the personnel for that, but they can spend their time better in other areas than always maintaining the, trying to maintain the, the field. So the initial layout for uh, the field in the fall is two men in 28 uh, hours. I used the, the hourly rate about $20. And that's for someone who's a maintenance one worker that has about 12 years in our district, kind of in the middle. Um, it's $1,120. We also have a helper, which is another man for an eight-hour period. Uh, the mowing, if we do it by ourselves, it's about one and a half hours to cut the field. and We do it about three times a week during the wet wet, more wet season for a total of $900. Now this past year, we didn't do a lot of the mowing ourselves. Instead, we, did a get, we had a company come in, and the company did the mowing, they did the fertilizing, they did the seeding, they did the aerating, and that was a total of $4,200. Um, this is also personnel cost, so if you take all of these, you take the personnel cost, you get $3,283 just in personnel um, uh, to, main, to, to strike the field. Now we also buy uh, <coughs> paint for the field. You can see the, the pails here, four pails, um, black color, white color, yellow color. They all add up to uh, maybe $3,000 or so, a little slightly under $3,000. So if you add all of this up, we have $21,367.89. That's not what it costs for the, the entire field. What we have to take off is, if, we, if, we, if we're not doing the mowing, you can take off 1,000 off of it. The other thing that's significant is the estimate of water usage. That number represents what it costs us from June to September. We can't figure out if it's going to the field or if it's going to washing floors. or So the majority of it after this year was probably going to the fields and trying to grow the grass out here. But let's say just half of it, another $5,000 to water the fields. Now. I don't have the stats up here, but there are some advantages, obviously, to having uh, the turf, and that's obviously save money on water and maintenance and everything else. Yeah, the only maintenance that really occurs on, on uh, turf is that you have to rake it out every once in a while, and it means putting, getting an attachment in the back of a gator and, and raking it out, and that's part of the $760,000. And they come in and they also do a annual uh, maintenance um, uh, cleaning of the, of the field, they'll run a magnet and pick up anything that might be metal in it and everything else. But uh, what we're looking at is basically basically around $10,000 of savings in the maintenance costs from going from natural turf to synthetic. So this is what we would have left in the balance would be about $352,690 over an eight-year period, which means about $44,086 per year would come out of the PI levy. I did not figure in any type of financing over that eight-year period, and we have to talk to Mr. Platko about that. So understand, this does not include anything uh, to do with uh, interest, which might have somewhat of an impact on, on, the, on the amount. Now, turf should last between 10 and 12 years if you maintain it correctly. The turf is getting so good that a lot of schools are getting that much and many years out of it, particularly the company that we're talking about. Because we didn't just take their word for it, we've been going to different schools and asking them about uh, the service from the company, how long it's lasted. There are some turfs that looked 
uh, they were five, six years old and they looked brand new. With some companies, there were some that were a couple years old that looked like they needed to be replaced already. We're not dealing with the, we're dealing with the companies that we know that are, are good quality companies. Now, replacement cost is going to be about $350,000. So that's one of the questions is, you know, how do you replace it? You know, that's great if you're able to pay for it, but then what do you do when it needs to be replaced? There's a couple different options. You can put additional funding out of the PI that will be required to build the replacement over an eight-year period. And if you do that, it's probably almost doubling that number. And we don't want to take $80,000 or so a year out of the PI levy fund, even though after a couple of years, we're not going to be spending this much money band-aiding buildings. But there's a couple other options that we can have. Years 9 and 12 would generate approximately, if you continue to put in the 44,000, you pay for it after the eighth year, but if it lasts another uh, uh, years 9 through 12, and you still put in that $44,000, you're gonna generate another $176,344, okay? And the other good thing about it is the cell tower, again, every five years, 15%, it increases. The cell tower will generate another 97,000, $910 during the same time. So if you put in that amount of money over a 12-year period, you would generate that amount of money to go towards the replacement. If you add that, you're about at, what, 275 or so thousand dollars? So you have to come up with another 75. But the great part about it is that's the only amount of money that we would need to extend, have turf and extend it out another 12 years with no cost at all. So basically, it would pay for itself if we continue to pay forty-four or so thousand dollars a year. It's a good deal, I think. The, the the advantages of having a synthetic field, we can get all the kids from all different programs, youth programs, soccer, football. We have a club lacrosse team. If this comes to fruition, we're going to put lacrosse lines on it, even if it's a club team. In Chardon, I know that they have uh, a, a synthetic turf and they bring all the kids from the youth programs on it. Even in the, in the uh, wet season in baseball, how many times they cannot practice because the fields are muddy. They can practice on the football fields. I see it all the time, all around. Um, there's just a lot of what we can do by, by getting synthetic uh, turf. Um, but this, these are soft numbers. Hopefully by December 6th, I'll have something a little bit more concrete and we'll also talk about what it would look like if we decided to finance over the eight years um, at the rate of about $44,000 or $50,000. Also in the board um, agenda today, you're gonna be voting on purchasing the three acre property over at Sidley for $100,000. Um, again, according to the OFCC, they say, they suggest you have 16 acres of property. We have 13 now. This would at least maintain some of the fields in the back and give us a few more options of where that footprint's going to be. And um, it's a signed copy by Mr. Sidley already. If the board approves it tonight, we can sign it and we can be done with that. And then that property will be secured to, to build on. Um, I'm not sure if the board knows. We did meet with the other fellows that owned the property next to Stearns. That's on the 608 uh, girdled corridor, and it doesn't look like they're willing to um, work with us on a price, um, not at least one that we will accept. And so at this point, we're working on uh, 10 acres over on that other property that's owned by a, a resident over there, and uh, we're going to go in that direction. So hopefully we'll have that secured in the next uh, week or so. And that's all I have today. And again, I just want to reiterate the idea that if we do do the turf thing, it has nothing to do with the bond. <coughs> no money is coming from the bond. This is a rendering from uh, from Field Turf. It's one of the companies we're talking about. The end zones might change a little bit if it, if, if it works out for us. The track in itself, we thought we had to replace. It's old. Latex tracks don't last very long. We've had it for 14 years. Um, I have someone coming uh, at 2 o'clock tomorrow to take a look at it. Um, there's a process by which they don't have to replace it so long as it's not peeling. There's no potholes in it. It's not cracked, and we don't. We have good asphalt underneath it that they come in, and they shave off the top. They put another layer down, they spray it, and it's about a third of the cost of replacing it, and it's good for another 5 to 10 years. So we're looking at it to keep some of the costs down too. Question, are, if you pointing towards the camera, 
Is it possible that, that people at home might be able to get a better view of that? Can you put that online? Or, you know, that might be even a better idea. Again, if we, if we don't do this, we, we don't get the $230,000 also from Lake Health. So we gotta, we got to strike while the rain's hot. Right. Okay. Are we required to put two logos on the field or just one? We're going to put two. We're going to put two. Yeah. Sure. Um, Manor put one on and they had their deal. We're going to put two. One facing the uh, um, home side, one facing uh, the other side. What is the yearly maintenance from talking with the two parties regarding the field with those little black beads that they put inside those turfs? Is that an added cost? Uh, no, that's called the infill. And uh, depending on what companies you talk to, um, most of them say you play on infill, not necessarily the fibers. Um, the one company we're talking to has a lot of pro uh, stadiums that they've done. And um, they, uh, there, there's a thing called G-Max. And it's the amount of force uh, that is absorbed when you drop something into the ground. And uh, there are certain numbers that you have to um, adhere to. And uh, I think when they put in the turf, it's around 160, and you can't go over 200. They say that most of their testing that they do, even for fields that are 8 to 10 years old, still are well under the uh, amount that's allowed uh, for the safety of the kids. There's also the question about whether or not the rubber causes cancer. Um, they, there's no study, at least that we know of right now, that says that it, it causes that. There's a lot of um, schools that have the rubber in the field. I know Chardon does, because uh, I've been on it before. Um, there are other infills that we can consider. The ones are, are sand-based. Some are sand that's covered with acrylic. But those are a lot harder surfaces than the, the rubber. And um, so far as we know, it's, it's safe. Yeah. And uh, that's the, one of the reasons. If it wasn't safe, I don't think they would be suffering right now. So. Yeah, and just make the observation that certainly since in the tenure that I've been on the board, which is almost now five years, we certainly have worked with constrained budgets. But, but we have worked to not only live within the, the uh, confines of the budgets we have and continue to provide an excellent education, we've also tried to find other ways to enhance the experience of our students. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that what we've talked about here by putting different financial aspects together from the, from the uh, uh, sponsorship from Lake Health to the cell tower and what have you, putting together and weaving that together, minimizing the exposure to the taxpayer, while at the same time clearly improving the experience our students have, plus frankly some safety aspects as well. Um, I, I think that that is, is what we're all about, and Excellent. I think this is really terrific. It is. We've worked on it for a, a, a long time, and um, we were finally able, we are working with Lake Health for a while there. We couldn't settle on, a, on an agreement, uh, but uh, they, they worked very hard, and so did we. We came to an agreement. We have to have them as a partner. And uh, we're looking forward to, to starting a project like this. Like I said, I'm hoping by December 6th I have hard numbers. I can bring it to the board and the board can say, go ahead and we can get rolling on this. Great. Thank you. Very exciting. Mr. Plyko, Treasurer's Report. Okay, I'm going to pass around uh, the monthly financial report for October. Um, as you know, we started creating these each month, as we close each month, creating this, this packet. And, you know, after tonight, we'll get posted on the treasurer's page on the website for anybody to view in there. Uh, just want to flip through a few pages real quick just to highlight some things. I know I emailed this out a few weeks ago, but we'll just to kind of go over here at the meeting. Um, on page two is a copy of our bank reconciliation. I'm looking to consolidate more of our accounts. Some of it's already been done in November, which isn't reflected on here. So make this a little more cleaned up, but then now that the bond passed, we'll be opening up new accounts to keep that, those money separate. So you know, we'll add more accounts to this going forward. And I also plan on, as the bond progresses, we're gonna, I'm going to create some type of report to, to help track our, our spending and investment options when, when that time comes. Um, the next page is just a, a fund balance report. Uh, nothing too alarming here. The, the food service fund ended in a negative cash balance in October. Um, nothing major at this point. There's a lot of encumbrances to make it look a lot worse, but we encumber for the entire year, so that's why it's such a large negative number. But 
we don't anticipate food service to end in a negative, and we'll closely monitor that as we go on. Uh, the PI fund as well, you know, once our next settlement comes in in January, it'll clear up our, our, our negative there. And then the, the funds at the bottom with the grant funds are on a reimbursement basis, so those should always be negative, basically. Um, the next page on page four, just our appropriation summary, basically a summary of our, our budget at the fund level. Everything is still within budget, so there's there's really not much to, to be concerned with at this time on this report. Uh, the next page on page five, uh, this is this page kind of follows the form <coughs> of the five year forecast, the same categories. The first box compares October last year to October this year. It we're pretty much in the same, you know, pretty much as expected there. Looking at the next set of boxes, the 2016 fiscal year to date compared to 2017 fiscal year to date, the only large variance that we have at this point is in line 1.05 property tax allocation. That's the homestead and rollback money we get from the state. And for some reason, the payment's late this year. We still haven't received it. Usually it comes in early October, and we have yet to get it yet, but that, that'll be coming in soon, hopefully. <laughs> I'm looking to try to confirm when that's coming. But. Uh, the following page on page six is our revenue report. So this kind of just breaks out our revenue lines in more detail. And once again, just the, the homestead and rollback line is the only one that's that's really out of whack at this point. Uh, what's nice is interest income. We're already we only had projected five thousand income. We're already at eight thousand six seventy five, which and just we'll keep increasing that as we go on. So that's the only one that, that kind of sticks out. Uh, at the top of the page, I always put that you know we're four months through the year, so we're 33% through the year. We've collected 38% of our revenue, so it, it's good we're ahead of that number. So, I mean, with plus the way the property tax, we have large settlements, it kind of throws the percentages off. But we're, we're in good shape so far on, on the revenue side. And then the next page, the next set of several pages is just um, more of a line by line breakout of the general fund e expenditures. Uh, we're, th you know, 33 percent through the year. Salaries are trending at 32.9 percent. Benefits at 33.7. We're still in line there. And then the only one is purchase services. We're trending lower, which is a little bit kind of like we expected so far. And we'll just continue to, to monitor that as we go on through the year. So I think that's about all I had for the financial report. If anybody has any questions on that. I'll get this post on the website for, for the public. Thank you. Uh, Very just nice. One other thing I just wanted to, to, to point out on tonight's agenda uh, on the finance section, uh, letter H, there's a, what's called a resolution certifying the county auditor the amount of voted property tax to be levied and collected for the purpose of paying debt charges. So this is basically a resolution we're required to pass in November that basically directs the county auditor to, to levy the tax and add it to people's tax bills since it was approved at the November election. Awesome. And that concludes my report. Thank you. And then they get a copy of that, correct? Yeah, we, we filed one you a copy of both Geauga County and Lake County. We have, to, we have to do that by November 30th. Okay. Any other questions? <coughs> That takes us to public participation. Anyone wishing to address the Board of Education will be recognized by the Board President. Speakers are requested to identify themselves and their topic. Comments are limited to three minutes. Do we have any? Rich? Hi, uh, Rich Armstrong. I'm a Leroy parent. Um, <clears throat> is there, uh, you haven't secured the, the second partial for the, uh, I mean, you talked about the Madison Avenue. Mm -hmm. Where, where's the other? Uh, the other center? one's located just south of the Summerwood entrance oh. uh, on 608, and the individual has a proposal from the board. On, on 608. It. Yes. Chuck, could you turn the mic? Oh, yeah. Sure. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, that takes us to the consent agenda. The consent agenda price provides for a more efficient use of time. Any board member can remove a consent agenda item to be discussed and voted on individually. Finance and audit. 
Uh, motion to approve the items listed on the finance audit <coughs> consent agenda is recommended by the treasurer. Items A through F. I'll second it. Thank you. Is there any discussion on any of those items? If not, can we call the roll? Belinda Grassi. Aye. Tom Hack. Aye. Stephen Jeffries. Aye. Jennifer Harden. Aye. Jack Miley. Aye. Motion carried. Next, we have a resolution G to approve a real estate purchase agreement with Sidco LLC for a vacant property located immediately behind Madison Avenue Elementary School, which is approximately 2.94 acres. The purchase price for the property shall be $100,000. Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Can I call the roll? Tom Hack. Aye. Stephen Jeffries. Aye. Jennifer Harden. Aye. Jack Miley. Aye. Belinda Grassi. Aye. Motion carried. And last, we have item H, resolutions certifying to the county auditor the amount of the voted property tax to be levied and collected for the purpose of paying debt ch charges, which is in Exhibit D. I'll second. Thank you. If there's no discussion, you can call the roll. Stephen Jeffries. Aye. Jennifer Harden. Aye. Jack Miley. Aye. Belinda Grassi. Aye. Tom Hack. Aye. Motion carried. That's exciting. That's super yeah. exciting. <laughs> Takes us to personnel. Uh, motion to approve the items listed on the personnel consent agenda as recommended by the superintendent. Items A through E. Can I give it a second? I'll, I'll second. Oh, I'll second it. Any discussion? Can you call the roll, please? Jennifer Harden. Aye. Jack Miley. Aye. Belinda Grassi. Aye. Tom Hack. Aye. Stephen Jeffries. Aye. Motion carried. <coughs> Curriculum programming. Motion to approve the items listed, the item listed in curriculum and programming consent agenda as recommended by the superintendent. Item A. I'll second. Thank you. Any discussion? Okay, if you call the roll, please. Jack Miley. Aye. Belinda Grassi. Aye. Tom Hack. Aye. Stephen Jeffries. Aye. Aye. Motion carried. There, there is no motion since it's just a first reading. It's a reading. Do I read number eight? <coughs> or do you read this? You have um, to read all of them. Hmm. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, this is an early one. Um, uh, be a result that, that 842, the Board of Education, the Riverside Local School District. 742. So, I'm sorry, 742. Really? It, was, it was weird. I'm not going to say seven. Jesus. 742 that the River um, will adjourn to, adjourn to executive session to discuss purchase of sale or property. Do I have a second? I'll second. All right. Mr. Uh, Flacco, can you call the roll, please? Belinda Grassi. Aye. Tom Hack. Aye. Stephen Jeffries. Aye. Jennifer Harden. Aye. Jack Miley. Aye. Motion carry. Probably that. Twenty-eight. Look at there. Holy cow.